Hello, and thank you so much for your attendance at this session. My name is Casey Ross, and I'm the director of the American Indian Law and Sovereignty Center at Oklahoma City University School of Law, um, where I also serve as a faculty member teaching in the American Indian Law Program. Um, the American Indian Law and uh, Sovereignty Center is the academic law and policy center at Oklahoma City University School of Law. The center houses our American Indian Wills Clinic, um, and that clinic provides estate planning services to American Indian people in the state of Oklahoma who own an interest in trust or restricted land. Um, the clinic also provides an opportunity for law students to gain some practical experience actually practicing law before they graduate. And they do that under the supervision of a licensed attorney who's also a faculty member at our law school. Um, we're in our 11th year of operation. And in that time, we have executed thousands of documents for um, individual tribal citizens in the state of Oklahoma. Um, our center has enjoyed a really long partnership with the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. I'm very happy to be here with you all today for this conference. And I look forward to when we can all convene together again in person once it is safe to do so. So today's session is going to focus on estate planning during COVID-19, um, really kind of examining the legal requirements for wills um, with some stories and some ideas for continuing to meet the needs of landowners during this ongoing pandemic. I'd like to start um, just with some statistical data on how COVID-19 has impacted tribal communities. Um, the data show that Native communities have been hit hard by this pandemic, and the statistics that are coming out of Indian Country are far worse than other demographics. Um, as of the date of this presentation, IHS data shows over 182,000 reported cases of COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. The data show high percent positivity rates in Indian Country with facilities of the Navajo area office, the Phoenix area office, and the Oklahoma City area office, showing those highest rates of positivity um, as high as 16.9. Um, overall, nearly 10% uh, of tests have shown positive um, since the onset of the pandemic. Um, please keep in mind that this reporting does not capture data from tribal citizens who are tested at non-IHS facilities. So the surrounding data of the community should also be examined to really get a full picture of the impact um, in a particular tribal community. There are some exacerbating factors that result in a deeper impact of the pandemic in tribal communities. Um, tribal communities as a whole um, work constantly to increase access to healthcare in Indian country. Um, and the difficulties of an already strained system are much, much worse with the additional strain of the pandemic. Healthcare workers, first responders in Indian country continue to work harder than ever. And I really hope that we're able to show them just how appreciated they are for continuing these monumental efforts. Um, another exacerbating factor um, comes from just limited data um, for the pandemic in Indian country. Um, the data that's available so far doesn't aggregate IHS facility data with non-IHS patient data. So to get a good picture of the true impact in the tribal community, we need to be looking at IHS data, tribal health facility data um, for those tribes that run their own health systems and self-governance. We also need to be looking at data from tribal citizens accessing um, private health care. And also, you know, the data for non-native relatives who live in and among um, tribal citizens in homes and communities. Before we get into the meat of the presentation, I just want to recognize and honor all of us who have been affected by this pandemic. Um, we've lost elders, family members, friends, community members, um, all to this deadly disease. And I have found it really important to try to give honor to that reality anytime I'm engaging in discussion about um, these times. To start with, um, all of us are really working to navigate various and oftentimes conflicting government imposed action surrounding this virus. Um, none of us get to work in a vacuum and we have to be aware of the various governmental action that might be imposed in our area. 
As a reminder, just be sure to familiarize yourself with the exact restrictions that have been placed by any one of these sovereigns or any combination of these sovereigns in your community. Um, we've got to look at um, tribal governmental action, local cities and towns, states, and also federal restrictions to really have a picture of how to navigate providing services during this pandemic. It is also important to remind ourselves that over the course of the pandemic, restrictions imposed by various governmental offices have changed, sometimes from day to day, sometimes from week to week. Um, some sovereigns are restricting travel, um, even mandating kind of an imposed quarantine period for individuals who travel away from that area and back or away to a particular area and back. Um, many um, have mandated closures with remote only work plans. Um, several of the federal offices are still under that directive nearly a year into the pandemic. Um, in addition, um, on a more granular level, um, governments have their own directives um, on what essential services look like for a particular purpose. Um, and the restrictions on each of those essential services. Uh, for example, in Oklahoma, our governor quickly exempted lawyers and legal services from early on you know, lockdown orders. So it's important to just constantly check in on any restrictions and any exceptions to those under tribal, state, and federal law. Another important reminder is just that different areas have different concepts of mask requirements. So be sure you're prepared to comply and also that you're prepared to ensure compliance with your clients. Um, for what it's worth, um, my observation has been that on the whole, tribal governments have imposed more safety restrictions and more mitigation strategies in our tribal communities than um, the state governments have. Um, so while you know, some folks find those mitigation strategies to be somewhat cumbersome, it's really important to comply and to keep ourselves and our clients and our community safe in the work that we're doing. I wanna spend um, just a little bit of time talking through some of the legal considerations we'll need to examine as we continue to discuss how we're moving forward, continuing to provide estate planning services during a pandemic. So when we're working to execute estate planning documents for tribal landowners, we've got to make sure we're paying attention to the requirements of the law. So the American Indian Probate Reform Act dictates the rules for wills that dispose of trust and restricted property and also trust personality. Um, but a will drafted in compliance with APRA does not necessarily also comply with tribal or state law for non-Indian uh, real or personal property. That becomes really important when you want to draft a will for a client who may own kind of a mix of property, right? Um, several of our clients here in Oklahoma will own an interest in trust or restricted property, but then will also own a home in town, right? So that individual is going to need a will that can dispose of both of those assets. And because of that, we need to be able to comply with kind of two sets of laws when we put that will together. Um, a word of caution, if you are not a licensed lawyer, please be sure that you're not engaging in the unauthorized practice of law without a license. Um, I'm a big advocate for making sure that you're getting legal advice from a licensed attorney in your area, um, just to make sure that you don't cross any line and get yourself into trouble for um, the unauthorized practice of law. So, so much of our focus today is going to be on APRA, since that's the most widely applicable law that most of us have in common. Um, please be aware, some tribes have promulgated their own probate codes. So in those communities, you're gonna wanna follow that tribal schematic. Um, but let's just spend a moment reminding ourselves of the requirements for a valid will under the American Indian Probate Reform Act. Um, the statute um, is really clear. Um, that any person over the age of 18 who has testamentary capacity can execute a will. Um, that person's going to want to execute a will that validly disposes of the trust or restricted land or trust personality that he or she owns. And really, um, APRA tells us that to be able to uh, dispose of property, you're going to want to execute a written will that is signed and also dated and that is also attested to by two disinterested adult witnesses, okay? So those are really the 
only requirements for a will to be valid. We'll talk a little bit more in just a few minutes um, about some other kind of bells and whistles to think through. Um, I do want to spend just a moment talking about holographic wills because really at the beginning of the pandemic, it was one of those situations where it seemed like everything was kind of shut down, right? Maybe just for a month or so, but everything was kind of shut down and folks weren't out and about um, moving around, going much of anywhere um, or accessing services um, any place. Um, and a, a large discussion started up about attorneys advising clients on how to execute holographic wills. Um, when we talk about holographic wills, you know, that doctrine was really designed um, for just those instances, right, where a person wants to write a will, but doesn't have access to a lawyer, or any formal mechanism for executing a will. Um, and the overarching requirements of holographic wills are found in state law, right? Um, on the whole, um, the majority of states have holographic will provisions in their state statutes. And the majority require that holographic wills be written 100% in the testator's own hand, own hand writing, right? Um, that means the testator has to write every single word. Um, I remember in law school, in the wills class, um, we read a case where a testator wrote her will in her own handwriting, except for a very important set of words. Um, so she had some kind of house and an acreage and she decided to name it, you know, to give it like a name, something like Smith's Manor, right? Um, she decided it was gonna be this kind of interesting named area. And um, when she wrote out her will, um, she wrote everything in her own hand. So it would have complied with her state's holographic will statute. She wrote everything in her own hand, except for the words to describe her manner. And the reason this became an issue is when she you know, came up with the name for this Smith's Manor or whatever, um, she decided to have a stamp made, right? Just a stamp um, and it was calligraphy and it was cursive and it was you know, really fancy writing. And she would use that stamp on letters and on different papers and such. But when she wrote out her holographic will, she kind of wrote, I leave and left a blank space to X. And in her mind, she was thinking it would say, I leave Smith Manor to this person. But what she did was she said, I leave and then left that little blank space and stamped with her fancy calligraphy stamp, the name of her manor right there, right? Interestingly, um, the court reviewing that case found that the provision, that particular provision in her holographic will was invalid because those stamped words weren't in her own hand um, and didn't comply with the requirements of the statute, which required um, her will to be written in her own handwriting. So I tell you that story because um, it illustrates, I think, um, you know, when they say, you know, every word needs to be written in the testator's hand, um, that's what those state laws um, have been interpreted to mean every single word. So I talk about holographic wills. It's a little odd when we start thinking in terms of APRA because under state law, most state laws, you know, the, the wills need to be drafted entirely in the hand of the testator and they need to be signed and dated, right? Um, APRA requires two witnesses, no matter which kind of will we're talking about, right? Whether it's one that's typed, one that's printed, or one that's handwritten, um, APRA requires that two witnesses attest the will no matter what. So that's, you know, different than, um, you know, the, the general understanding of holographic wills under state law. Um, so it's just something important for us to remind ourselves of that witnesses will be required um, in even a holographic will um, under APRA. I want to spend just a little bit of time also talking about self-proved wills, and this is really where the pandemic um, started to create some issues um, for folks to get their estate planning documents executed. So when we think about this concept of self-proved wills, I want to go back and remind you when we list out those requirements for a valid will, that's a valid will, right? Self-proof will, I kind of talk of as a bells and whistles addition to an otherwise valid will, right? The self-proof will is really a will um, where the witnesses kind of swear out their testimony that they would be giving in open court, but they do it right when the will is executed and they do it in front of a notary. 
And the idea is if that attestation is included with um, the otherwise valid will, there won't be a need to call witnesses to prove the will, right? Um, in open court, you're going to be able to just, um, you know, see that notarized statement from the testator and from the witnesses and um, consider that will to be a self-proved will. So um, there, there's a format that's really called for in the APER regulations on self-proved wills. Again, um, a self-proving a self affidavit needs to be signed by the testator and also signed by the witnesses and notarized. So it's that notary requirement, right? That's just a little bit more, um, uh, more work than an otherwise just you know, signed and witnessed will. Um, as a reminder, the self-proving affidavit language um, set forth right in the regs. Um, you can absolutely pull that and cut and paste it into a document and have it signed and notarized and append it to a validly executed will. Um, I will tell you that this self-proving affidavit language um, is not the same as self-proving affidavit language that's recommended in state statutes. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you get some legal advice on um, how to ensure that the will that you are drafting can dispose of all of your client's property it's intending to dispose of and to utilize the right self-proving affidavits for the type of property you're dealing with. Um, but for APRA compliance, you know, the words are right there in the regs. You can cut and paste them and, um, and put those on the self-proving affidavit. So let's talk through some of the difficulties that have been encountered when we're talking about these notary requirements. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, you saw, you know, everybody kind of doing things a little bit differently. But what you did see was you saw some, um, some states being really proactive to try to address concerns that come up anytime there's kind of a legal requirement or, or a formal requirement um, for folks to be able to get business done. So some states, um, you know, immediately passed kind of changes to their notary requirements to try to alleviate some of the difficulties for clients. Um, so some states are just all across the board allowing notaries to notarize documents via video conferencing. Um, most of the requirements are that the notary can see the person and the person can see the notary. Um, the notary can see the person's identification when it's held up to the camera and the person can send a copy of that identification to the notary for further examination. Um, and those kind of requirements are put into place basically where states are saying, hey, notaries, it's really hard to get together in person right now. Let's set up kind of a way for you to do this via teleconference so that um, folks can still continue and getting their business done and their documents executed. Um, a lot of states specifically call out and say we're allowing this exception to our otherwise um, more restrictive notary requirements, even for wills, right? So some states allowing this video conferencing stuff to occur for wills um, and other estate planning documents. Um, some of those states are Texas, uh, Michigan, New York, Delaware, Pennsylvania. Some states, including relaxed notary requirements for some purposes, but not for all purposes and not um, for purposes of estate planning documents, right? Um, here in the state of Oklahoma, there were some um, different notary requirements that were implemented during um, the election um, for absentee uh, ballot voting. Um, and, and, you know, that is great um, for that one kind of distinct area, but um, would be really nice to see um, a little bit more relaxation of those formal notary requirements for other purposes as well. And then some states just smooth have not um, modified their notary requirements for any purpose whatsoever. If you want to get a notary, you're still going to have to get together in person and have um, the client show a valid form of ID prior to the notary um, signing off on the document. So make sure, moral of the story is make sure that when you are planning for the execution of valid wills, if you're planning to use self-proving affidavits, which I always recommend, um, make sure that you've kind of lined out how that notary function is going to take place and think through, um, you know, whether you've got any kind of um, relaxation of restrictions to maybe do it by a means that doesn't require in-person contact. Um, I want to take just a few minutes to kind of talk through um, how our Wills Clinic operates um, because I want to spend some time talking through some modifications that we've made during the pandemic um, just to 
just to really kind of put out there some alternative approaches that seem to have worked. Now, typically our Wells Clinic has 10 students every semester. We have a Wells Clinic in the fall, a Wells Clinic in the spring, every single academic year. Usually about 10 students enroll and over the course of the semester, we'll have about 50 clients total. And, you know, students work with their clients throughout the course of the semester, um, get to establish a really good client relationship with individual clients. Um, and things, you know, go well, like they've been going well for the past 10 and a half years, right? But then, you know, March came, March of uh, 2020 came. And when we start thinking of how things changed at that moment, like I said earlier, everything just kind of seemed to close down right then, right? Everything was closed down. Now we were navigating not only um, local restrictions, but also university restrictions on COVID mitigation strategies. So from March through August of 2020, um, the clinic didn't, um, didn't have any in-person contact with any of um, our clients. And that was a really difficult time because while we were not engaged in any in-person contact, the demand for services certainly didn't diminish. In fact, it increased. Um, we had a number of folks who were on our wait list for services. And over the course of those months, um, we lost about five folks um, to the pandemic. So it just became really evident and really clear that we were going to need to figure out a way to navigate the restrictions um, and to get estate planning services out into the community. So from August of 2020 until now, we have been um, operating a modified approach to providing these estate planning services. And I wanna share a little bit about um, how we've done that. So in a typical semester, um, the students work with the clients and really have an opportunity to meet with their clients a few different times, by phone, by teleconference, in person. Um, obviously, the students have to conduct the intake meeting, which is um, the meeting to kind of fill out paperwork and get a good understanding of the client's family and also assets to start uh, thinking about how to put together an estate plan. And then after that, there might be follow-up phone calls or teleconferences or even in-person meetings to get more details and to talk through drafts and to make edits. And then um, every single client meets with um, the students in person to review a final draft, make any last minute edits and execute um, the will and all the other documents. Um, so when we talk about these document execution appointments, um, typically we have reserved space at some, some site inside of a tribal community. Um, the professor and all the students kind of pile into a couple of cars and drive 100 or 200 miles out to wherever we're needed and set up shop for the day in, you know, usually a small room that's been set aside for this purpose. We've had a lot of individual tribal um, community buildings offer us space. So we have set up shop there for uh, days at a time. And then we've also had a lot of luck with um, the, the local um, agency offices here allowing um, our students to set up and execute wills. So typically, you know, it's the full cohort. It's the supervising attorney professor, it's the clinic staff, it's all 10 students, you know, riding down into um, the community together in a car and setting up shop for the day in a room. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a big, huge space where there's a lot of social distancing. People are sharing tables, they're sharing, um, they're sharing paper and sharing printers and such. You've got um, really, you know, the, the students engaging with the clients to review documents. And so you have a lot of handing paper back and forth, handing pens back and forth, um, even among the, you know, um, clinic faculty and staff, you have folks, you know, handing each other pieces of paper and such um, just to go through reviews and edits and changes. And what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So there's a whole lot of touching going on of all these different implements and a whole lot of passing those around typically. So it's also, you know, typically been pretty close proximity. I mean, you do everything you can to ensure confidentiality and privacy, but um, when you've got to call in some witnesses and call in a notary and get everybody kind of convened around one table to have the testator swear out the, 
self-proving affidavit, you know, you get more than, you know, a couple people um, put together. And that's just typically how it's worked for 10 and a half years. Um, so what we had to do is we really had to reimagine that client engagement um, from the beginning all the way to the end to try to reduce the amount of time our students were in person with each other and in person with clients, um, but really to try to adhere to the mitigation strategies that have been set out um, at the governmental level and also at the university level. Um, so first thing we did was we eliminated all in-person client contact until and except for the execution appointment, the document execution appointment. That required our students to engage mostly via phone consultation with clients. Um, oftentimes our elderly clients won't have email addresses and won't have um, computer access or internet access um, or just the knowledge of how to do it sometimes. So um, in, in the absence of being able to email documents, um, the clinic uh, students really did start to engage with folks via snail mail, right? Um, sending drafts of documents with handwritten or typed up letters saying, hey, you know, here's a draft of your document, take a look at it, let's, you know, get back on the phone or you can mail it back to us with some additional information. Um, you could imagine that that slows things down, right? I mean, that's a totally different approach to um, visiting someone in person or um, having the ability to engage um, kind of on, on the spot in person. Um, in addition, the clinic students also were able to take advantage of teleconferencing capabilities for those clients who had that capability as well on their end. Um, that was something we hadn't done before. We, we didn't meet with clients via Zoom um, prior to the pandemic. Um, so that's another kind of difference in the approach that we've adopted. Um, for clients who do have email addresses or computer access, um, internet access, and also um, just, you know, who, who are on email, um, we were able to start um, sending documents for review um, via email. I will say it's really important to pay particular attention to confidentiality requirements when you're talking about sending things through email. You obviously want to protect any um, uh, individually identifiable um, personal information, particularly health data, social security numbers, et cetera. Um, but even more than that, you know, we had a couple of clients who said, well, I'm not on email, but my daughter is. So why don't you just send the email to my daughter and she can print it off and bring it over to me. Um, that really is a confidentiality issue. Um, and you just want to be really careful if you start emailing back and forth um, confidential information with a client. You want to be sure that you are paying attention to those confidentiality requirements and not breaching them. Um, there's always a different way to approach it if you need to go a different way um, to protect that client confidentiality. I'll tell you that this reimagined space um, really resulted in a complete um, rethinking of how we configured those meeting areas. So instead of having um, students and faculty and staff and clients and other folks kind of crammed into a small space, um, we had to think of doing things a little bit differently. Um, first of all, a lot of our typical meeting sites and tribal communities were closed. They were just closed. So we really had to go out and find new areas, new facilities that we could um, either ask permission to use or um, in some instances rent um, from hotels for conference space, um, just we, we found a technology center and asked them if we could rent one room um, for the day. So, I mean, we really had to kind of go back to the drawing board to identify spots that would be um, accessible for our clients to get to. We also um, just put into place a whole lot of new rules. So um, instead of taking 10 students and a couple of cars every time we go out into the field, we started limiting the number of folks that we took. Um, so a limited number of students were able to participate at each site. Um, we actually don't allow any access for clients to come into the indoor space. All client interaction takes place outdoors. Now in Oklahoma, the climate is temperate enough where we can find um, some days in either semester, spring or fall, that are conducive to having folks outside. Um, but, you know, uh, it does present a little bit of a planning challenge on days like today when um, it's a snowstorm um, in this area today. Um, 
So we also um, set up the workstations um, for students to be 10 feet apart. So no clients come in, only the limited number of students are inside of the space and we're, we're putting them way far apart, 10 feet apart at separate tables. Um, we set it up so that nobody is sharing any pens, any paper, any other materials. Um, and we also made sure that our students um, wore masks 100% of the time when they are inside of um, kind of the staging area for putting together um, packets to take out to clients. When we talk about client interactions, again, those client interactions only take place outdoors. And we have configured our services to be done um, via drive-through only. So, um, Clients really just pull up in their cars and students um, have, have been indoors um, putting everything together and then pop outside with everything ready to go um, to have the client go ahead and execute those documents. So before the day of being on site with the client, the students have been talking to the client, um, emailing with the client or snail mailing with the client, making sure to have all of the drafts reviewed, have all the changes that are going to be necessary made so that on the day of the execution appointment, really the only thing left to do is to um, review that final, final draft once again, just to make sure it's 100% right, um, and then execute the document um, without a lot of back and forth. Um, the students um, and the clinic staff wear PPE at all times including masks, face shields, um, gowns, gloves. And I'll tell you that we were able to partner with the um, Oklahoma City Indian Clinic to get some PPE donated um, over to our Wills Clinic, um, which has been really, really helpful and really useful, um, not only to be utilized by students in the clinic, but also given to clients if clients appear and don't have um, you know, a mask or a face shield, um, it's been really nice to be able to provide that for folks who, who come through the drive-through. Um, masks are required for clients. So you know, if a client shows up without a mask, um, we give them one. Um, it's also been really interesting to figure out how not to share any materials. So we have a number of clipboards that are sanitized at the end of every day and the clipboards aren't used more than once. So when a client's document is ready for review and execution, it goes on to the clipboard, it's picked up by a gloved hand, it's taken out and held in place um, for a client to really review it. Um, and then that clipboard goes into kind of a used bin and goes back um, for sanitization and cleaning and won't be touched again the rest of the day. So really trying to be um, super diligent about not sharing back and forth any materials. Um, sanitized pens are, handed to a client, um, client keeps the pen, doesn't hand it back. Um, the whole idea is just to not be passing objects back and forth. And again, paper, you know, just making sure that um, internally we're not circulating paper amongst each other and um, certainly not letting a lot of hands touch paper before it's presented to a client to take with them. I wanted to share just some pictures so you can get a visual of um, what it has been like out in the Wills Clinic community as we've been um, trying to serve the needs of our clients. Um, here's one of our students standing right outside of our law school. Um, our law school is located in Oklahoma City and we'll oftentimes have clients who are either local to Oklahoma City or um, are visiting Oklahoma City for some such reason. And so they can swing by right outside the law school and um, you know, have, a, have a document executed pretty quickly. Um, this picture shows um, one of our clinic students on site at a tribal um, community facility um, working with a tribal client through that kind of drive through approach that I described a little bit earlier. Um, and, and here's a picture at that same facility to show um, kind of a line of cars. We just have folks kind of line up and uh, separate their cars with some distance and um, the students are able to just kind of get outside and um, work with the clients. Um, I'll tell you um, from, from kind of the response we've received from clients as a result of this, don't get me wrong, okay, it's not ideal to have your will executed at a drive through but um, we have found that, you know, demand for services hasn't diminished in any way since the pandemic began, if anything, it's increased. I'll tell you that, um, you know, over the last 10 and a half years, when we set up a date of services, we might have you know, 15 folks on a schedule in one day. 
And typically we'll have, you know, one or two or sometimes three folks who just kind of don't show up. They don't call, they don't cancel, they just don't show up. And then, you know, we'll get back in touch with them later and get them on the schedule for a different day. But we've really seen a reduction in those no-shows. Um, folks are showing up for the appointments um, and are really um, motivated, it seems, to get these documents executed. Um, I'll tell you that our clients um, have, have always been extremely appreciative of the services that the students provide, um, but there's even an additional layer of appreciation now um, because the clients kind of see um, the thought that's put into keeping them safe during you know, this pandemic, and there's just a whole lot of appreciation for the clinic continuing to provide these services um, during the pandemic. Um, and it's really, you know, resulted in um, positive experiences, both for the clients and for the students um, as they're working through um, keeping, uh, keeping the, the services rolling out into the communities. You know, it's really interesting to think through, but it's possible that some things we've learned in this pandemic experience, it's very possible that we will continue um, thinking about um, using these alternative approaches, right? Um, it's certainly helpful um, for some folks to be able to drive through to get services, right? Um, um, it's also, um, you know, really highlighted that there are all different kinds of ways that clinic students can interact with clients. Um, it doesn't always have to be in person. Um, and so really, you know, figuring out what serves the client's needs best moving forward, um, but to really be open to the idea of continuing some of these practices. Um, you know, I'm, I still continue to be interested in maybe some reforms to notary requirements. Um, I like the approach of a lot of the states we talked about earlier of, you know, teleconferencing um, notary meetings. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense during a pandemic and maybe um, into the future. Um, but really, you know, our focus is on thinking through how to make the process easier for our clients, um, because the, the biggest issue is we want to be able to encourage um, the continuation of estate planning services in tribal communities because it's so needed. So whatever we can do to make that process easier, we want to do to encourage more folks to execute wills. Um, as we all know, that's extremely, extremely important. Um, I really appreciate everyone's attention today, and I look forward to interacting with you all. Um, I will tell you, you're free to email me at any time if you have recommendations of things that you're doing or that you're trying, um, or you're free to email me with any questions. Um, I want to give a shout out to um, our Wills Clinic staff. Um, our Wills Clinic professor is a, a, a former student of mine um, named Emily Elif Therakis. Um, she's a Cherokee citizen and has done a wonderful job providing the leadership as the faculty member who oversees the individual students work um, with their clients. I also want to give a big shout out to our wills program coordinator Lori Harless. Um, she is also a Cherokee citizen and has worked with the clinic since before its inception when we were just trying to figure out how to get these kinds of services out and give some students some experience. Um, so it's just a wonderful group of folks who are really focused on uh, providing these kinds of services out in the tribal community. And I appreciate their commitment and their continued work um, more than I think they're ever going to know. I'd also like to um, give a shout out to one of the clinic's partners, um, Oklahoma Indian Legal Services. Um, Oklahoma Indian Legal Services is a legal aid um, service here in Oklahoma City that provides um, services to American Indian people all throughout the state of Oklahoma and Oklahoma Indian Legal Services also provides estate planning services um, and you know we're partners and we support one another very very much. Um, Stephanie Hudson's the executive director there and has had quite a bit of success also. Um, I think she might have been the first one in the state actually who kind of re-envisioned a way to get services out during the pandemic so we learned a lot from her leadership um, and continue to value the partnership that we have with Oklahoma Indian Legal Services to really try to spread out the services that we can provide um, to get as many folks um, wills executed as possible. So um, with that, I'll end and just say again, thank you for your attention and I look forward to interacting with you all. Thanks so much.